there's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking just rocking in a way that's true if you know what I mean just take a look at the senior scene well it's rocking I'm gonna talk a little bit about farming in Orange County and I'm gonna take you back uh, a long way we're gonna talk primarily about the 1920s to the 1950s which takes us through the Great Depression as you probably know here's some of the here's where I was born I am sleeping in the bedroom <laughs> I was born in right here in this corner of this house right there. You still, Miss Pat and I are still sleeping right here. That house was built in 1926. It was built, it's 3,400 square feet. It was built for $3,200 of cash money. Wow. All we had to buy were the nails, the window panes, and the doorknobs. Everything, all the lumber, every, well, and the, and the uh, cedar shaker. By the way, this is a, a shingle roof now, but it's, back then it was, it was cedar, cedar shaker, made out of wood, the first 1926. This this goes into the milk house, it goes in 10 gallon can. This is the milk house right here, where you have the cooling water, also where you have stainless steel vats to wash up the, the utensils. All this has to be washed every day. These things have to be washed out. That has to be taken down, washed, cleaned, or you get in trouble with the county health department inspector. You never know when he's coming. Never know. You know, make sure you're clean from the start. So this house was built in 1926 with cross tie money. You say, what is cross tie money? That's oak trees that my granddaddy cut and hauled the carburetor to the, there's got a guy here from Carburetor that knows that Carburetor is known as the cross T, -T capital of America back in the 20s. There's pictures out there in Carburetor showing it. 30 and 40 new pool wagons unloading cross ties at the depot in, in Carver. This, then he, the second year he built this lounging barn. Does anybody know what a lounging barn is? This big barn right here? It's still there by the way. All this is still there. Lounging barn is where the cows go after their milk. They go in there to eat a little hay, lay down on fresh straw and leaves or pine straw and rest for the night. Then the next morning you get them up and bring them back in the milk. Uh, you see these two patches of, of dry dirt here, that was the gardens for the farm. Here's where the trough that the fed silage going in, right down that trough. I hear these are salt and mineral blocks that cows can lick on to get their nutrients, minerals, magnesium, selenium, all those kind of things are in these blocks here. Uh, let's see, what did I leave out? Smokehouse. I'm sure somebody's in here wanting to know about the smokehouse. Yes, Kenny? What did, you, what did you keep in the smokehouse? Hams. They, they put them in sacks and hang up the hams. They had a great big box at the back, that, what they call the salt box. That's where you put the loins and the other parts of the pod. And you use salt to preserve it, right? Preserve it. And you kept, kept it. We had ham, like, you know, all year round. Yeah. We ate good. <laughs> Everything was from the farm. Yes, sir. You got a question here. How, how much milk does an average cow produce a day? I, about 50 pounds back in those days. That's now, they've gone now to where, I hear, if you go to, go to, uh, what's it, you dare, Maple. Maple View, where you get your ice cream and all, they've got some of the finest cows in the world there. And they are, where we were averaging 50 pounds, 45 to 50 pounds per cow, they're up to 100 pounds per cow, if you can believe that. A day. A day, a day. So they milk 150 cows and run the milk under the under the ground in pipes into the pasteurizing building. Yeah. So Neville is a British name. And it was originally spelled N-E-V-I-L. Somebody added another L and E later. I don't we don't know who. Uh, the Neville's are very famous on the southern side, almost in the Chatham County around, if you know where Damascus Church is, we, we are the rich the Neville's are the original charter members of Damascus Church. Now that time it gets to me, that's a different sect. They saw it's a different sect than Neville's, but it's the same. You go back all the way to 1760, it'll be the same group. An interesting thing about this picture here is I call it the four oldest families in Orange County. That's the Hogan's, the uh, Strayhorns, the Neville's, and the Blackwoods. Two of those are on this picture. There's four Hogan's on here and four Neville's. If you look down here. At the bottom, this is my grandfather, my father, my cousin, and this is Willie Neville. 
He's a distant cousin. About the fifth time he gets to me. But the interesting thing about Willie Neville, Richard, you know what's interesting about him? I don't remember. He, he's the first guy to ever have an airplane in Chapel Hill. <laughs> he had a little, little two-seater, huh. and he would take my daddy and some of these other farmers up to, you want to see how it is up there and look down? You know? That guy right there had the first airplane. Let's see, what else can he talk about? Carver, when, when I was born in the first 10 years, was only about 2,000 people. 2,000. Anybody have any idea how big Carver is now? I just looked it up. Almost 20. Exactly. 20,600. So he has 10 times as many people as it was when, when I was born in 1939. What do you think Chapel Hill was in, when I was born? 12,000. It is 60,000 now, not counting the students. If you throw the students in there, you're talking about 90, 95,000. So it, they've really grown. But Carver has grown twice as fast as Chapel Hill percentage-wise. It's called, what is it called now, Richard? Parish the Parini of the South. <laughs> you get that? Any of you people living in Carver? In the Paris of the Sand? <laughs> yeah, that's what it's called. So Carver started off as a little town that take the depot was the main thing. Another interesting thing about Orange County, had 74 dairies here after World War II. 74. Like our our little dairy, family owned, 30 cows, 40 cows, and you had the big ones as I explained up in the North Park. But the, you needed a lot of milk right after the war. The GIs were coming back, they were getting married, they were having babies, all the babies need milk, couldn't produce enough milk around here. Now that's gotten down to two dairies surviving after 74. In 47, there were 74 dairies here in this county, and that is only two. And you know, for Mapleview, y'all know the famous one, this left. Um, What's the other one? Out our way, it's, uh, it's the, uh, help me back, uh, Crawford Dairy. Crawford, Crawford. Right. Let's talk about sharecropping. How did we get the labor back in the 20s, 30s, 40s? And it was sharecropping. And it wasn't just you think the sharecropping is only black. It's not. We had two white sharecroppers originally in the 20s before we had any black sharecroppers. <coughs> Skinny's family. And I had a midwife, and she had a midwife that came from his family. Right over there on Neville Road. Midwives. But we, the point I want to make is we had two white sharecroppers, and they're still in the neighborhood. Their descendants are. We don't talk about them, but they, they're still there. They're not too proud of it. But anyway, it was quite an area. If you, if you had to just work where you could make 50 cents. 50 cents. We had a boy, a teenage boy, to come and live with us for four years upstairs in the bedroom I eventually inherited. He came like in 1933, before I was born. Lived with us three years, worked on the farm, and was drafted. He went into CCC. Anybody know what CCC is? It's Conservation Corps. Yeah. 300,000 of those, Roosevelt signed the document, took all 300,000 of them into the army the same day. He went to fought in Europe, fought all the way through, didn't have a wife or a family, so he just stayed over there. He kept fighting, and dad, gummit, in the Battle of the Bulge, he was killed six weeks before the war was over. Three of these guys, him and two more, are buried in our little country church out here. We're quite proud of that. A lot of you think of milk is just liquid fluid milk you drink, right? Can anybody name the other five kinds of milk of products that come out of milk? Butter milk. Butter milk. Well, that's still a liquid product. Cheese. I'm thinking more of cottage cheese, butter. cheddar butter. cheese, butter. butter. Who said butter? Butter. butter How about powdered dry milk? That's the biggest thing that the people in Wisconsin and California, the big, big dairy states, they, they take the water out of the milk. Milk is 86% water, 4% minerals, and butter fat, and they ship it overseas. You see those 100 pound bags of dry powder being loaded on the ships? That's dry milk powder. Okay? A lot of different things out of milk. Keeps a lot of people alive all around the world. Gordy, <laughs> yes, what, uh, what crops did your uh, father you. grow? Yeah, thank you. And for like, what, what, kind of, what kind of diet would be a typical diet? Uh, uh, on the farm? Yeah. Oh, well, we ate too much fat hog meat. We didn't trim any fat off of it at all. We just ate what you call cholesterol city hog meat, <laughs> sausage, all the fattest stuff. We eat uh, chitlins. chitlins. You know what chitlins are? Yeah. The washed guts of hogs. It just been, you know, somebody people back here can tell you all about it. Right. Um, so you raised hogs. Oh, yeah. We, well, we, went to, we went subsistence farm first, then the cross ties, old cross ties, then the cotton. Then the dairy, and then the beef. We five, five, we transitioned five times on that farm. 
Fata. Oh, okay. Hmm. And and uh, excuse me. Yeah, they would they would eat everything from the hog. Everything but the squeal. Is That's that, right. you know? <laughs> <laughs> really? They they, they eat liver mush. You know, anybody know what everybody eating liver mush? Yeah. Ugh. Oh, look at that, there's one right down there, liver mush girl. Yeah. I like the sausage and the hams. The hams that were put in these old smokehouses uh, were just too salty. I mean, they salted it. It took 100 pounds, 100 pounds of salt just to, just to salt down 10 hams. They just covered them up in salt. And of course, as they sit there for six months, the grease and all coming out, you know, and so forth, it, it, it was not healthy, I can tell you that. <laughs> But well, tomorrow, they also did a lot of exercise. That's, it, that's the key right there. You hear what she said? When you're eating that kind of high calorie diet, you need to be working 10 hours a day. And that's what they did. They never stopped. They took an hour for lunch and they took a siesta. What was that? They took a nap every day at lunch. My grandparents and old people. And they lay down there and start reading the paper. That part of the paper would be right. He sucked the paper into his face. And they were rested. And at 2 o'clock, they started all over again another day, two to nine, and sometimes they could work at eight thirty, nine o'clock in daylight. Remember, they didn't have any any electricity in the original. Lord. Yes, sir. Yes. You started out as a dairy farm. It's a dairy. Well. Now you started out. Your, your parents started out as a dairy. Yeah, my my grandparents did. Yeah. yeah. Now you're a beef. Is that beef. Right? That's right. Yeah. Why did you switch? Uh, labor. 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 It takes a lot of labor to run a dairy. Uh -huh. okay. you gotta, you got to have more. Beef cows don't take as much of anything. They just live mostly on grass and hay. That's all we feed them. But dairy cows have got to have grain, <laughs> soybean meal mixed in. they got to have all kinds of things. that the beef, beef cows are easy, basically. You know. You don't have to milk them. don't have to milk That's right. <laughs> That's the main thing. Even with milkers. Even with electric milkers, it's still a job. You know, to milk all those cows. You got to get them up. You got to, you know, wash them all and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me give you an interesting point. Is it probably still was? Uh, interesting point on how my granddaddy got started in the dairy business. Remember, he was the oak, oak cross tie guy. He get eight cross ties on a, on one wagon load. That's all the mules could pull up and down these hills around here. Was eight cross ties. You get them over to Carborough. If you go to the Spotted Dog restaurant, you can see a picture of these. 30 or 40 trailer loads of cross ties coming into Carver. They got one on the wall in there. Wow. They used to have one in the mall. Mm -hmm. Did you see that remember that, Richard? Yeah, there's, there, was, there was one. I think it's still yeah. there. Yeah, it's, there's two or three in Carver showing yeah. the, how many cross tie loads came into Carver in the 1920s and 30s. That's how they made the money, right? made their living. And then Granddaddy said, but then he went to cotton in the, in the late 20s and the beginning of the Depression. What, what wiped out the cotton? The boll weevil. Yeah. He came through and just wiped them out. You know, they planted and expected to make two thousand dollars this year. They had nothing to say. Boll weevil got it all. So that that, that may change his mind on that. He said, "Well, I'm gonna go into dairy business. All these boys are coming back from the war. They're gonna have babies. They're gonna need milk. So he didn't have any cows to milk. So he would sell a bale of cotton whenever he had one. And on the way home, he would see a cow out in the pasture. He said, "You'd like to sell that cow? I'll buy it." <laughs> And he'd sell a bale of cotton for $25 <coughs> and buy a cow for $25 and walk her home. And they walked them all home until they got about 30 in two years. Well, then along came, he was doing good, and he forgot one other thing. Back then, the university didn't have any summer school. So, what are you going to do with the milk in the summer? Oh, yeah. He got 30 cows with milk running out on the ground. What are you going to do? So he came up with a novel idea. I will let you... If you have two kids, you can have one of my cows for the summer and give it to you. You just feed her in your yard and out the ditch banks, wherever there's some grass. If you have three kids, I won't give you two cows. If you have four kids, I won't give you three or four cows, whatever you need. And then at Labor Day, he would go and put the halt on them and bring them home. Walk them. Walk them all home. Didn't have any trucks. Isn't that something? Is that a tough way to start something or what? Uh, when, we, when we really got to rolling in the dairy business, and, and not just what I call scrub cows that buy from a neighbor, little old Jersey cows that give, you ask about 50 pounds, these were back down to 30 pounds when we started. We, we really started at the bottom with quality. And then we, um, the Hogan's, the Hogan's again, decided to get with the county agent and go to Wisconsin and buy two, two carloads of 
purebred Holstein, really good cows. And they, they limited it to one cow <coughs> per dairy, unless, unless you had a brother that was in it, but you could get the maximum two cows per farm. We got one. Thank God she was pregnant. She was pregnant. And, and she, when she delivered, she delivered a boy calf. We used that boy calf as our sire, and he improved our production and our herd by 40%. The two years later when those first calves started delivering, delivering their own offspring. It was unbelievable how much they improved in just one generation. And then we kept improving from that. But that one cow, one bull, I know it was so funny. John Thomas said, put her in the barn, and she was so long. We, we used to these little tiny cows about eight feet long. This thing came in and she was like 13 or 14 feet. Her feet hung off on that side and her head was sticking through up here. We'd never seen anything like that. We had to go redo our, our trawls where the manure hit. Another interesting thing about Carver, and, and my wife knows about it more than I do, Carver had four family-owned grocery stores, little tiny grocery stores. Each one of them had a butcher shop in the back that cut their own meat. You go down and they cut your own meat, whatever, you want a pound of hamburger, wait 10 minutes, go up around the shop and get you, get your cereal and come back, I'll have the hamburger ready, ground, ground it right there, sausage, ground it right there. Each one of them have a butcher. And this is, this is way before the Kroger's and the food lines and all these big companies came out. These were family owned, two, two man operations, the butcher and the guy at the front. Four of them in Carver. Four of them on that main street in Carver. One of them is where, uh, Tyler's. Tyler's is one of them. Uh, other in Amadilla, Amadilla Grill is one of them. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, Tyler's is actually two of them. There were actually seven. Well, was what, where where uh, the parking lot for the the places now the depot behind the depot. Uh -huh. There was a place called there called Carborough Cash Grocery that was run by the Partons. And then where Armadilla Grill is now was Hearns, and right beside it was was Powers, right. and uh, right. and then there was uh, Lenny Hearn yep. that was down, yep. to, uh, and then the the Andrews and Rigby, <laughs> and then Bill Hardy across the street, and where where the PTA thrift shop is, there was another one called Thrifty Food Store there, right, mm -hmm. and all, right. seven on all family owned on Main Street. I got it laying right here in a book. It said that Jesse Neville in 19, 17, 1792, Gave a hundred dollars and sent four slaves to the university to get built the first building on the campus right here. Hmm. One year before the, the campus, the, the university is noted as the oldest state-supported university in America, founded in 1793. He built the first building in 1792 right here hmm. with a hundred dollars of his money. A hundred dollars from then to now would be like I don't know a hundred thousand. I guess Richard, you help me. But there's some real interesting things in here, and this is where we get our history is out of this book right here. I was able to trace all these people. And Pat, you're going to hand out, you got it? Yeah. You're going to hand out, she's going to hand out a generation to show you the nine generations, the name and the year they were born and died of, of this farm right here. And remember, it came from Lord Granville of England. Let me tell you a little bit about Lord Granville. Anybody know about Lord Granville? Oh, yeah. He was a favorite of King of England, King Richard. Richard. King George II. No, first. King George II, thank you. George, yeah. King, King George II. He was a favorite of his. There was eight of them to start with, called proprietors. And they're just friends of his, like the, the knights of the round table. So he just said, hey, I got this, I got this little farm over there called North America. North America, Canada, all down there. You, you guys, don't you want it? And they all said, yeah, we want it. And then a year or two later, he said, well, I forgot to tell you, I'm going to tax you. And they said, hell no, we don't want it. We're not going to pay all those taxes. And the only one that stayed around was Lord Granville. And that's who we bought this farm from. And you can see the deed right up here from Lord Granville. Wow. His agents, they called them sales agents. And they all stayed in the state capital. At that time when we bought it, where was the state capital? Hillsborough. <laughs> Agent came down from Hillsborough. It's only 10 miles from our farm. Yeah. It's right up there. <coughs> 10 miles. Can you name the three capitals of North Carolina? And Tryon was the first. Under British, it was Governor Tryon. He was British. And then Hillsborough during the Revolutionary and Civil War, and then Rock. Why did they pick Rock? Center centrally located. located. Who said that? That's it. Yes. Centrally located. And why was that important back then? Everybody was coming coming to business meetings on horseback. So you don't want to make the guy in Nashville drive twice as far as the guy in 
up here. You want to get it in the center of the stage, you can. I understand Ashburn was in the running right for the last, whatever, to <laughs> committee find the side on rock. But you want it as, as close as, look at every other state capital in the United States. They all in the center of the states. No. Just about, the best they could, right? You're a historian back there. No. Huh? <laughs> they in the center. <laughs> center of the state, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the dairy cooperatives that were formed here. You oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, here it is right here. This yeah. is amazing. <laughs> they couldn't get paid for their milk in the 40s. These companies wanted to screw them, really. And Kerr Scott, any of you know who Kerr Scott was, a famous governor, and his son was a governor? Uh, they poured milk out up here at Burlington, in Hall River. Just poured it down the drain. They couldn't get any, couldn't get a 25 cents a quart. And they said, we ain't going to milk these cows for 25 cents a quart. So they, 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 it's 49 men right here said, we're going we're gonna, to, and Scott's not in here, by the way. Scott formed another company. He formed Coble and Melville, Melville M, not Neville, Melville, there in, in Burlington. But these guys here formed Farmers Dairy Co-op in Chapel Hill. Can you believe that? In Chapel Hill. And he had another Hogan as the top man right here. That one right there. Anyway, and this guy, this guy right here, let's see. Where is Mr. Charles Stanford? He was the chairman of the, the, the uh, Orange County School Board for 13, 14 years. Some famous dairy farmers. Real smart guys, really. And they formed a co-op. And the way you, you had to buy stock in it. We're talking about in the 1930s. This picture was taken in 49. They'd already been operating for 10 years. $25 a share per cow, and that allowed you to milk that cow. You couldn't milk more than you had stock. If you had, we had 32 shares. We were number six can. Our, our milk was number six. Our check came number six. And uh, you, you couldn't milk more than you stock. And if you're going to try to increase, if you have a son coming on, you want to increase your dairy, you had to buy more stock, <coughs> if it was any for sale. And the only way you could get any is if somebody had died and left it back to the corporate, to the court. Yeah. And then this little bear here, with John Sprunt Hill's money, a banker, and he, he put up enough money and they bought a bigger, the little fish bought the big fish. They bought Long Meadow Farms. You never seen Long Meadow signs around? These guys bought Long Meadow and moved everything to Durham, all the press, pasteurizing, bottling everything. Any other questions? I appreciate the good questions. Yes, sir. Have you lived here all your life, Gordon? I was born and raised right here, but I left for 38 years for the oh. paper company. When I finished at NC State in 61, I went to Charlotte with a job and went from there 38 years. I went from Charlotte to Raleigh to Statesville to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for 11 years, Memphis, and back. I'm like a rabbit. You jump in here and you'll go all the way around and you'll come back in that same <laughs> boat. You just stand and wait. You'll come back in about four hours. <laughs> yeah. They tried to get rid of me out here in the country. Hey, dear. We have tours of your farm. Do I have what, sweetie? Tours. Tours of the farm? Yeah, I'd be glad to have any of you come out. To, yeah, we, we'll take you on tours. Uh, we've got about 55 calves born in the last, in September. There's 17 right over here in the pasture. Uh, my partner, ex-partner's got about 40, 42. How many has Keith got this? 10? About 100. Well, all together. All together, the family's got over 100 cows. 100, 100, 100 Angus cows. <laughs> on, this, on this farm. It's, it's divided up in ownership with different people now. But we all work, we try to work together and, and keep it going. We, we're real proud of it. If you come out there on Old Greensboro Road, you'll run into white fences on both sides of the road. You'll run into white. These barns are all white. They've been painted, kept up. All this, all this is white in here. Uh, we can move, I can load 50 cows by myself in 30 minutes on a truck because because I can bring them in on this concrete pad here and run them in that state there, and we got a loading chute right over here. It's called a staging, staging area. You just put them in there and lock the door, and the truck backs in, and when he's ready, I'm ready. And we put them on there in a few minutes. And we can, we can grade them, too. If you don't want, you want 500-pound steers, and this next guy don't want 600-pound heifers, we, we can handle that, too. A lot of good questions. Yes, sir. Do you uh, sell individually or is there an yeah, auction house around? Oh, we go to South City primarily. South City is the biggest cattle market in North Carolina. There are 12 cattle markets in North Carolina where, where you sell them, but auctioneer, but the biggest one is in South City. Last Friday, they had 1,680 cows and calves that went through there in one day. Wow. 
that to be sold individually. Now sometimes they'll bunch three or four of the same quality, same genetics in the group, but basically they're selling them one at a time. They got through at 11 p.m. Those, those, those auctioneers, they, they have so many cows, they have to have three auctioneers. You can't sit there for nine hours, blah, 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 blah. Your throat gets so dry. They have three auctioneers that rotate them, and they keep a drink right in front of them all the time. Is this sell them for slaughter or no, for no. to other farmers they, raise? Both, both. The small animals that, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months old, they're being bought and taken back to the farm. Somebody's buying them to feed more. The big, what we call cull cows and cull bulls, are going to the slaughter plant in Ashbury. Randolph Packing. Over there, if you go over there and see that, that is unbelievable. They, they kill 280 to 300 cows a day, a day, cull cows. And you got one assembly line, goes straight down through the plant. There's like 90 men and women, 45 or six on each side. It's unbelievable. That cow starts out up here as a full, full size carcass, gets to the other end of the thing left but bones. I don't want to hold anybody up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so, ma'am. I know that a lot of farmers are having trouble keeping their kids on the farm to yes. take care. Yes, yes. Um, what's your plan? My plan is to raise a veterinarian and let him marry a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did well you get that? <laughs> and he educated at NC State, and he can get a job anywhere. In fact, he's in Pennsylvania, been up there 22 years with his little bride from Raleigh. Uh -huh. and she's a vet. And what they did is he does large animals, mm -hmm. dairy cows and horses. She does all dog cats, uh, armadillos, mm -hmm. armadillos, uh, anything else, <laughs> gerbils. She does all the small animals, wow. rats, whatever you want to do. What did birds, you graduate birds. out of college? Sir? What did you graduate out of Me? college? Yeah. Ag economics. Ag, okay. Yeah, ag economics. Had a great professor from South Dakota who taught me quite a bit. That the guy over here? I had three or four. I had three or four, but. Where is it? Yeah. Did, did any of you, did all of you get a copy of what we handed out? I see these ladies here that didn't get anything. Did you get one? I got one. There's two. There's two. I don't know. No, they didn't get the one, Pat. I don't know. What did you get? We get the farmers, the farmers thing. You got to remember that farmers thing is going to be in my obituary. We paid our dues all those years and it's so nice to be switching gears it's a grand new century and it's the senior life the senior life the senior life for me